Okay, well, welcome to Epistemology 101. This is uh, our uh, 19th meeting. There'll be a midterm in two weeks, and your paper's due by the end of the month. <clears throat> and uh, well, well, what we're trying to get at here, partially, is communication, that the world is made of the intention to communicate. Uh, there is information, we understand that, but behind the information there is something much more mysterious that is the intention of the information to be understood, the way in which everything is uh, massaging everything else with information. Uh, so that when you look into the heart of nature in this boundary dissolved state, whether you achieve it by yoga or shamanism or however, then the intentionality to be understood is there. We talked about, we talked yesterday about this conundrum of our, do we belong to this world? Is it ours or are we passing through? And is this a kind of a, something which holds us back? Well, the strong argument, I think, which bears on what you're saying, that we are of this world, is that it uh, communicates to us. It is intelligible. It's only when you existentialize your existence through living in cities or something like that, that nature becomes uh, silent on the question of the transcendental. You know, Jean-Paul Sartre, when he formed, formulated his philosophy in the 50s, said, nature is mute. Therefore, man can only look within himself for any kind of uh, structure or, or uh, uh, imperative to being. I reject that, and I think all psychedelic people m must reject that because what is being accentuated by the dissolving of boundaries into the world is the discovery then of the transcendental presence. You know, the scholastics had a, a notion which Kat and I used when we named our little company. The reason we named it Lux Natura, what that means is the light in nature, the light in nature. And it is literally the light in nature, the splendor in the grass. It's in the ripples. And it is affirming. It is affirming. And we are in many cases, perversely blocked against it. The way in which, perhaps, by sharing our experiences, we can begin to satisfy ourselves that the domain we journey to and from is not merely mental. And the way in which we confirm for ourselves that it is not merely mental is in the observation of uh, disturbances in this world that we call coincidental or synchronistic or something like that. Now, this is elusive, anecdotal kind of stuff, but nevertheless, there's enough of it that I think there is something there. What do I mean? What am I talking about? Well. As an example, I have lived 42 years. Only twice in my life have packages of matches burst into flame in my pocket. In each case, it was about four or five minutes before I turned somebody on to DMT. Well, now, uh, what? Yes, an interesting coincidence, a uh, totally non sequitur sort of thing, but twice in my life packages of matches have burst into flames in my pockets. It's other things, uh, 
many, many people who um, experiment with mushrooms report it's almost achieved anecdotal status now. Uh, the scurryings and rustlings on the periphery. And when you do mushrooms fairly frequently, you get with this to the point where you just say, oh, that's the rats in the walls, the scratcher from hyperspace, whatever it is. Because it's, uh, you know, you can't wrap your mind around it, but it's always there and then less easily confirmed and communicated, but I'm sure we all have had this experience, is you will take a voyage into another dimension, be completely laid out on the floor for a long, long time, and then sit up. And at the moment that you sit up, the fire flares up, the logs fall through the grate, the coals burst into flame. In other words, there is a wave of regenerative activity that sweeps through the whole system. And uh, people report playing with clouds. People report that after intense experiences, their lives are haunted by synchronicity. Well, psychologists get rid of this kind of anecdotal material with all kinds of se semi-weaselly arguments, such as uh, your, your clue-sifting intellect has been shifted from the background to the foreground. So now you are paying attention to the environment, and it is giving you messages. And I'm, we all know that schizophrenics move into mental spaces where every license plate carries a message. And uh, every headline is about them. And every conversation among the people they pass on the street is about them. But we all also know that we ourselves dabble with this, that this belief that the world is entirely independent of our minds and objective and unaware of us is the kind of science, uh, scientific fiction in which we operate. And then the real truth that appears to our perceptions, the truth of our immediate experience, is that the, the mind is a concentric field of diminishing intensity that can draw events and circumstances far from the ranges of probability. Uh, I mean, I had, once I had the following experience, it's all anecdotal, you see. I was in a dry wash in the Negev Desert, uh, and there was absolutely no food, and I was the poor traveling hippie, a hashashin, and a cave dweller, and a ne'er-do-well. And it was like 120 degrees outside my cave. And I was sitting in front of my cave, um, smoking hash. And out through the shimmering heat, I could see this dot of a person. And I, as I watched them making their way through the rocks and the scrub, uh, I began to have a fantasy about this person, that they had food, that they didn't simply have food, that, that they had oysters Rockefeller packed in ice, that they had Russian caviar, that they had Belgian chocolate, that they had all of this stuff. And, you know, I hadn't had a bath in three weeks. There was barely any water in this place. And this speck made its way toward me, getting larger and larger. And finally, it turned into this guy I barely knew, a fellow lost soul. This was in southern Israel 25 years ago. And he, sa and he came up to me and he said, I have oysters packed in ice. I have Belgian chocolate. I have, and he had uh, 
gotten a job dishwashing that morning at the King David Hotel and had just quit in disgust halfway through the day and had raided this super <laughs> fancy four-star hotel and just had a backpack full of this stuff. And I didn't even bother to tell him. I mean, what am I going to say, you know? I mean, sure, of course. <laughs> so these kinds of things, uh, and they're very private, you see. Nothing happens there except that a guy quits his job and rips off a uh, hotel, except that it is coincident with an internal state a private musing of somebody else. And when the two things come together, the coincidence of it is absolutely excruciating. Uh, Kat had a, an experience. She's not here to tell it. Uh, but uh, she went to Mexico when she was 19 and traveled all over Mexico and took LSD at a certain temple. and on the LSD trip in this place, she realized that she had been conceived there. And when she confronted her parents with it, it was so. It was so that she had been conceived there. Uh, now, of course, you can say, well, in growing up, this must have been a story told around the dinner table, and then under LSD, the child brings it out. But sometimes these things just peels reality apart. The purest proof that I've ever had that goes against the clue-finding, integrative, unconscious thing and really, the, the time wave that we've spent so much time looking at is, in a sense, a net to trail through life. It's a coincidental engine. It causes there to be more coincidences in your life. And in fact, a way to let coincidence in your life is to let numbers into your life. Uh, the schizophrenic who looks at the at the uh, license plates passing on the freeway is simply the lowest grade worshiper of numbers. But when you really let numbers into your uh, existence, coincidence runs rampant. We have talked here a little bit about the most astonishing coincidence of all, of all which is that mathematics describes nature. That's a coincidence as far as I can tell. Why should it? No philosopher that I have ever read, no mathematician has ever been able to make it make cogent sense that the abstract operations of the human mind should somehow map over the uh, core dynamics of nature. It's like a coincidence. Um, when I was working with the time wave, the most perfect example of uh, anticipation or disruption of ordinary flows of probability was um, I had this idea when I was working out the time wave before the 2012 date was chosen and settled on way back in the early 70s, I discovered a, an odd coincidence which went like this. It's embedded in a whole bunch of coincidences, but it goes like this. From the date of my mother's death till the time when I met the woman who went with me to La Cherera, 64 days passed. From the time I met that woman till the actual experiment at La Cherera, 64 days passed. From thence forward, three times 64 days later was my 23rd birthday. And looking at all these coincidences, I propagated forward into time, uh, not 
64-day increments to 384-day increments. And I discovered something really interesting, which was when you went from my 23rd birthday, 384 days forward, no particular big deal. But when you went 384 days forward again, it landed on um, the winter solstice of 1973. And I thought that this was mildly interesting. And so then I looked in a naval observatory almanac, and I discovered that uh, there was a total eclipse of the sun on this solstice, which I thought was pretty weird, and that this total eclipse of the sun uh, would sweep across the Amazon would only be visible from the Amazon basin, would be approaching totality as it swept across La Chirera, and it would, in fact, achieve totality over the city of Berlin in Brazil. Well, now, Berlin is a Portuguese word which means Bethlehem. And I began to see, I began to feel led. I began to feel as though I were being bad clues. So then I looked at the map, and you may do so as well, and you will see that the city of Berlin in Brazil, the city of, of Bethlehem, is situated in the delta of the Amazon. Well, I'm Joyce scholar and river freak enough to know that all rivers are female. And if you're too dense to know that, certainly the Amazon River is female because it is named the Amazon. I mean, Gaia is what it is, you know, and Amazon is a giant woman. Well, here in her vulva, in literally in the delta, and delta, you see, is this triangular, the Greek letter delta is a triangle and has been a schoolboy symbol for the female genitals for 18,000 years. Uh, in the delta of the Amazon sits the city of Berlin, over which on a certain winter solstice, a total eclipse of the sun will appear. <coughs> and I said, you know, my goodness, this is, uh, this is the stuff of prophecy, something marvelous. It must be going to happen there. And, you know, I, you must know uh, Yeats' poem, um, what's it called? The Second Coming, the one about what rough beast slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. And it is the imi an, an apocalyptic image, an image of uh, the shift of the aeon. So I had all this data, see, pointing at December 23rd, uh, 1973. And it, but I got this same argument from people, this argument that uh, you must have known, you must have seen these uh, uh, astronomical ephemerides at some time in the past, you must have an unconscious photographic memory, the mind must be a computer at some level, and so forth and so on. But what clinched it for me was early in 1973, still 13, 11 months before this much anticipated moment, uh, I opened the San Francisco Chronicle one morning, and it says, long period comma headed toward Earth. And I closed the newspaper and said aloud, I know that this comet will make its closest approach to the sun on December 23rd. Then I open the paper and read it. It says, yes, it will approach perhelion on the 22nd of December, give or take, you know, so many hours in Greenwich. And then I saw, for me, that did it. Because what it was, was a perfect proof. My wish had been granted. Because you see... No human being on Earth knew that this comet existed or had ever known because it was a long period comet. It had never in historical times been in the skies of Earth. When I had 
focused in on this date using all these clues, it was absolutely in the value dark dimension. You, it was not in the collective unconscious, unless the collective unconscious anticipates the future. And if that's the case, then there's no way to contaminate any experiment from influence. So, uh, you know, the, the mushroom was willing enough to provide for my edification this thing. Well, but then see what happened. You may remember this comet. It was the comet Cohote. And it was an excuse for all kinds of falderol. I mean, uh, harmonic convergence, eat your heart out. Uh, this was uh, a much bigger deal. And yet this comet, which physically should have blossomed out into the most spectacular comet of all human history, was a dud. And once again, you know, prophets ate it right and left, and uh, booksellers were left with vast, unsold uh, inventory. So, uh, to me, it's like play. It's like a joke. It's like if you can't, if that doesn't seem like a joke to you, then you don't have a sense of humor. You know, it's not going to hand over alchemical gold because, after all, why should it? Who are we to be the recipients of alchemical gold? But it does tease and it does play. And I think if you're playful enough, you can coax it into being your playmate. And perhaps in these boundary dissolved states, this is what, what happens. I've told the story about uh, how in the Amazon, when all this stuff was breaking loose, I went through this period where very calmly and deeply and without having any need to tell anyone, I thought, I came to the opinion that I was like enlightened. And it was this very low-key thing. It was all about appropriate behavior. This was the cognitive hallucination that I was having. It was about appropriate behavior. And I had this idea there's an appropriate way to do everything. And if you do it the appropriate way, no energy will be lost. And so you become like superconducting. You become like some kind of super Tai Chi character where... You just do things so nifty that there's no problem, whether it's plucking a flower or moving a boulder. And I was told, when you think, sit on the ground. This was, there were all these teachings, and they were very simple. They were things like, sit on the ground, stupid, and, uh, you know, use your fingers. That was a big teaching. Use your fingers. <laughs> So one of the things I was into was how you wash the pot. We had one pot. It was this little enamel pot. And we would bake it over a fire, and we baked beans, and we baked rice, and all these terrible things that would get scum on the bottom. And so it was a big deal about drawing lots for who washed the pot. Well, I discovered in my enlightened state that we had been doing it all wrong. And that if you would go down to the water with the pot and, and take sand and pat it very, very lightly in the bottom and then say, please, that then all you had to do was pour water into the pot and swish it around and empty it like that. And then when you looked in, it would be like Drano, you know, it would just be blinding white. And I did this several times, and I thought, how appropriate a miracle this is. This is a real miracle. I mean, this is just simple stuff. It's totally here and now. It's absolutely Taoist. It's completely, you know, on and on. Uh, so then I had a critic in our crowd, and so I thought that I would enlighten the critic by a wordless demonstration of my obvious command of the howling Tao. So I invited the critic to in accompany me to the river. And, uh, 
and I said, and now notice that I pick up the sand, I pat it into the bottom, I'm not agitating it. I look into the sky and I say, please. And then I put water in it and I swish it around. Voila! I said, is something supposed to happen? <laughs> and I look and the crud adheres. And then this person says, you know, I pity you. <laughs> And I would pity you more, but you alarm me. <laughs> this was the sequela to the, to the thing with the dancing butterflies, which was at the same time and the same thing, which is in my enlightened state, totally master of the Tao, I would go into the woods and I would hold out my hand, my outstretched hand like this, and butterflies that I had hunted relentlessly for months with a 16-foot extendable Japanese killing machine that uh, was my tool in trade, these canopy butterflies would come down and land on, the, on my hands and strut and show their iridescence and tears of joy would stream down my face and I would kneel down and they would all line up in front of me, and, and then I would weep more, but you know, how much cathartic weeping and joy of this sort can you contain? So there would be this little nub in the experience which would begin to grow stronger, which was all about, this proves that I'm on to something. Nobody could look at this and not realize. And blah, 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 blah. said, I must show someone. And, by the, and the critic had not spoken to me since the pot watching incident, <laughs> but was very, you know, on me. So then I went back to camp and I said, let's just take a walk down the trail. Maybe we can work out these differences. Thinking that I wouldn't even mention it. I would just sort of, as I was consoling them, put out my hand and, and uh, you know, butterflies would drop from the trees. They would realize the error of their ways, so forth and so on. Well, of course, you know, that didn't happen. So then I said, well, maybe I'm being too humble here. I should at least make a commitment to the thing. So I said, stand here and watch. And I raised up my hands to call the insects of the jungle to me. And then the line was delivered the second time, you know. I pity you, and you are, you're not, you're war, you know, <laughs> you're, <clears throat> this is all true. It is true that the butterflies danced on the back of my hand. Well, so what do you, what is one to conclude from this? Well, I think what you have to conclude is that ego is the absolute impediment to Tao, and that if you care what other people think, if you care how it's going to impact on your reputation, if you care, if you have any of these um, lesser concerns, this, this power, this radiance, this dimension of authenticity can't approach you, you know? And we all have it. And I'm sure I have it more than most people. And yet, even I am able to let down into these places where the world works magic, you know? And I think uh, women and intuitive men and uh, uh, people who aren't quite as analytical as, as I may be are able to, uh, to do it much more. And that is the real proof. Now, you can talk about be here now till you're blue in the face, you know? But the real proof is when nature responds like that. Well, no, I don't mean caring about others. I mean that if you are, I guess that the sin is pride. The sin is pride. If it thrills you that you are enlightened, or if you're glad you beat out your competition, or if you want to display your uh, accomplishment, then it's ruined, you know? It can only be, it has to be held 
so very likely, so very likely, it cannot be shared in a sense. Forget sharing it, because we're not pure enough to share it. It's amazing that we're pure enough to occasionally uh, embody it, you know. I told you the story about sitting on the beach. It always happens when you're alone, because then you get no credit. You see, it's no credit to you, and you shouldn't get any credit. But sitting on a, a beach, I can't even remember the substance, but uh, something like this, or maybe something like this, I'm not sure, but sitting on a beach, meditating, holding my hands like this, and in the middle of the meditation, I become aware of something like a bug or something is on my hand and it's like tickling me. And so I ignore it and then, you know, and then I come back to it and then it feels fairly substantial. Maybe I should check this out. So then finally I open my eyes and I look down and there's a crab. And the crab is cleaning my fingernails. And the crab cleans all of my fingernails and then runs across my lap and cleans all of the fingernails <laughs> on the other hand. Well, what this is, is just sitting still and letting nature be what it wants to be and letting it manifest its intentionality. We tear through and bust up and smash apart. And then we say, well, that was a nice hike in the woods you know, and uh, always, if you will go into the forest and sit down, and it's about finding the time, finding the time of the place, and in the time of the place, the magic is coming and going in a way that if you're moving faster or slower, it, it, just, it just isn't there. And I've often had experiences that I felt that were connected with psychedelics, but the main function of the psychedelic was to get me to be still for a long time. Cat had a wonderful experience on a Mexican uh, pyramid. She was exploring it. She took LSD or something and fell asleep. And when she woke up, the tree she had been sleeping in that she had been staring into the branches before she fell asleep, and so had a very clear picture of it. When she awakened, a very large snake had shed its skin directly above her in the branches of the trees. Well, you know, part of this is the doorway into coincidence, but part of it is uh, uh, magical attunement with what wants to be. This is what I think Kay must have been indicating. This is not language. This is communication. This is, you know, the breath of the Tao. And everything that we say betrays this. So feng shui, geomancy, an elaborate theory about energy flowing through the earth. As a verbal model, to me, quite unconvincing. As a set of feelings about the world, as a sense of the intentionality of place, incontrovertibly true. You know, I said earlier, maybe we lie. Maybe language is to allow us to lie. That language betrays communication. Well, then we have to find our way into either silence, or gesture, or dance, or uh, song, some way of unbridling the horse we ride so that it can take us where it wants to go, which is back into this place where ego isn't grabbing. Because you see, it must be so that if the magic retreats from each one of us in the wilderness, how much more then it must retreat from us as a community, en masse, as a planetary species. So we live in a domain of triviality that we have created. 
You know, we have trivialized the world. The elves, the fairies, the water sprites, uh, the energies that flow in the earth with the seasons, the movement of the stars, the machinery of being, the, the drama of life and death. We push all this away and we hold ourselves above it. I mean, death is sanitized, birth is sanitized, everything is made less authentic as though we are somehow threatened by the authenticity of being. Why are we threatened by the authenticity of being? Uh, why does it take such tremendously powerful hallucinogenic agents to put us where we should be operating in terms of our pattern of caring for the world and for each other? And this is a real question, I think. Uh, it, it goes hand in hand with the question that I think is very worthwhile for the group to try and deal with, which is, if psychedelics are so wonderful, are we better people? And if they are wonderful and we're not better people, then why not? What, is, what precisely is our relationship to people who know nothing of this? Uh, is this a way? Is it the way? Is it no way at all? How, how does the mystical vision feed back into how we are with and for each other? Are we doing enough with that? Are we, um, you know, do we exemplify enough what we know and what we feel? And if we don't, how can we? Because this is our faith, I believe, that we have something precious that we want to give to those who are operating without awareness of it. But before you give something away, you know, you have to wonder after the consequences. I don't have answers to this. I think this is what, this is the question that should hover over our lives. Do we embody um, the radiant correctness of what we say we are uh, pursuing? I certainly feel that I am uh, a flawed and fragile vessel for this. I mean, my, my strength is my ordinariness. It must be. It's the only suit I can play. So that must have been the idea, you know, that it would be Joe anybody. But how can we uh, make it live for ourselves? And this is a problem with the evolution of language, the evolution of communication, of caring, of intent, and then of, uh, of implementing the vision. I don't know, maybe I'm impatient, maybe it's happening, and maybe the awareness of the changing earth, the awareness of the needs of the earth, the awareness of the needs of women, uh, the awareness of social injustice generally, is all part of, uh, of this thing. I had a very um, satisfying experience recently a guy, a publisher and editor, came to see Kat and I from Australia. And we talked about all this stuff, and he was a fellow psychedelico. And he said, nobody had ever said this to me before, he said, from where I'm sitting, I think that you're winning. And by your winning, what he meant was that inch by inch, by inch, the dream is actually gaining ground. There will be a second hearing. There will be an appeal from the absolute judgments of 20 years ago. Well, then in that case, it devolves upon all of us to embody this thing and to not cut corners and to, to you know, as it says in the Grateful Dead song, try just a little bit harder, just a little bit more. And I think doing that, 
And a lot of it is a letting go. It's not a pushing into. It's a letting go. Then the magic draws close. I mean, uh, nature loves courage. You've heard me say this. The way nature loves shows her love of courage is by removing obstacles. That's how the shaman can dance in the waterfall. He can't dance in the waterfall, except that he's so damn courageous that God suspends the laws of physics in the face of such faith. You know, it's something like that. It's the courage to be, the courage to be. To be is to dance in the waterfall. And I'm really not, if it sounds like I'm berating you, I'm not. I'm speaking, you're serving as a screen for my own psychotherapeutic process because I clutch at many levels. But fortunately, and thank God, you know, there were enough instances of recklessness and sheer error and pure madness and peer pressure and all of these things that I got a taste. And I think you all have a taste. That's what unites us in trying to run this thing to ground. And it's the heart of it that is so hard to talk about. I mean, I skim the ideas off the depth of a sea of heart whose boundaries cannot be taken, because that's my style. But the unsaid part the dizziness of the things unsaid. Remember the poem by Trumbull Stickney. I lean over your meaning's edge, and I feel the dizziness of the things you have not said. And the dizziness of the things unsaid, for us fans of dizziness, is ecstasy, the vertigo. Weren't we first spun in the ch schoolyard? Wasn't that your first altered state of consciousness, to be spun and spun until you fall down and watch the world move around? It's the dizziness of the things unsaid. That's a real problem for me. I'm a sayer, but uh, it's worth invoking it, uh, if only to let it resonate in the silence. Well, there are different things here. There's a, there's a lot of good in psychedelics that is not what I've been talking about today. Uh, a lot of people are hurting. A lot of people have traumatic uh, past histories. Uh, a lot of people uh, need to be, you know, unplugged, cleaned out, straightened out. Uh, I see the psychedelic experience as a birthright, and I can't, we can't have a free society until people are free to explore their own minds. It's so obvious. So, uh, you know, I'm as against restricting access to drugs as I am to burning books. It offends me in the same way. People must be free. We are the measure of the political universe, not the state, not the race. These have all been tried with horrible results. Uh, individual human beings must be free. Anything which ameliorates that has to be looked at very, very carefully. Uh, sexuality and the restriction of information access and understanding that revolved around that issue for the past 500 years uh, just shows me that we don't want to go into that with the mind. Because anything can be taboo. Your genitals don't have to be taboo. Your mind could be taboo. Anything could be taboo. But the presence of the taboo is so destructive and alienating and so makes community so impossible that uh, we have to take individual men and women and we have to make them free. 
that has that is the the system where freedom has to be maximized. I don't say that we have to convert these people to the existence of magic. In fact, we don't have to convert them to anything. The the nature of the beast, meaning the nature of these hallucinogens, will set the agenda once we are free to inquire. That's all. Freedom of inquiry. Well, on one level, you're right. The laws are totally irrelevant. We ignore them. So does everyone else. Uh, you mean we worry about them? <laughs> styles of taking and styles of getting together. Yeah. Well, this is like the same question about sexuality or automobiles or anything. Uh, obviously, though we say all people are created equal, we don't sell guns to eight-year-olds and this sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> but within the context of reasonable people attempting to reach reasonable positions, I think this should be as free as possible. I, I think there should be an institution for handling it. You see, if we were a primitive or a preliterate society, there would be shamans who would be professionals, and they would the would take out the adolescent boys and the adolescent girls and put them through ceremonies that would inculcate them into the secret life and belief systems of the tribe and then certain ones would be selected out to be the shamans of the next generation. We don't have any kind of institution like that. Part of my motivation for a public career is the belief that, that psychotherapy could be this. The motivation behind psychotherapy is entirely correct. But how can we make it real, you know? Uh, shamanism does this. You see, I'm not... I wouldn't go to a shaman for a cure if I had um, carcinoma or something like that. I regard them as most effective in the realm of mental problems, psychological condition. This is why when ethnobotany got started, the first things that are looked at are the psychoactive plants. Because if someone, if a shaman tells you this will cause you to see visions, he's probably correct. But if he tells you this will uh, cure a disease, this is less certainly so because the concept of curing disease is a more Western notion. The concept of restoring neurotic imbalance seems to be pretty generalized worldwide. I think that uh, if you're interested in drugs, the first stop is the library, and it's a long stop, and you educate yourself. This all seems very natural to me. This is how I did it and how all my friends did it. Uh, in the early 1960s, there were articles in newspapers about morning glory seeds and this kind of thing. We followed up and learned how to use scientific literature to figure out dosages and all of this kind of thing. Uh, for me, I mean, I take drugs seriously, so I also don't want, I'm perfectly aware of their capacity to cause a problem. So you want to be educated, you want to have all the information. So people, number one, have to be educated, and then they have to be given the freedom to decide. Now, inevitably, certain people will um, evolve pathological lifestyles, lifestyles of addiction, dependency, and abuse. But those people usually can evolve these lifestyles with, there are perfectly legal avenues 
to evolve these lifestyles. I mean, there is alcohol is obviously more conducive to these maladaptive lifestyles than almost anything else. If I were totally juiced, you could tell it. If I were a lifelong junkie and I had just shot, I could deliver this this lecture. It wouldn't trigger any awareness in you. So the debilitating, damaging, maladaptive drugs are all legal. And what is restricted then is stuff which gives you funny ideas. That's the problem, the funny ideas category. Well, put that way, it doesn't take long to see why. Because funny ideas are very problematic for institutions. On the other hand, funny ideas are the life breath of creativity. So who are we going to make comfortable? A bunch of control freaks? See, I think it was really a mistake in the 60s to try and take society away from the people who want to run it to wage revolution with psychedelic drugs where I don't know if those people realized but their their weapon was effective enough that the world's first nuclear power was quaking in its boots because you could produce 10 20 40 million hits of LSD well so that that's a terrifying to an establishment, because what if you change 20, 60, 40 million minds? But if it can be kept in a human scale, where you say out in California, people hang out at Esalen and then they take off their clothes and then they meditate and then a few of them go on to drugs. This is not, this doesn't threaten anybody. The, the way in which LSD was used to thumb noses at the establishment brought trouble. It, I don't think, should have been seen as a direct tool of social and political action. It should have been handled as a adjunct to creativity. Its agenda would have surfaced. We would have ended up in a better place. This is what Aldous Huxley wanted to do, you know. He felt that you go to the people, to the power freaks, in a non-threatening way. You don't say to them, hey, Mr. Dean, hey, Mr. President, a 100,000 acid heads have surrounded your administration building, and if you don't accede to these 15 non-negotiable demands, we're going to pull the place apart. But no, you send uh, uh, his friend that he went to Yale with to him, who says, you know, a few of us have been getting together and there's really this extraordinary thing happening and we think you should be brought in on this. This is going to be tremendous. But it polarized. I find it hard to understand. I mean, I like Leary very much, and Metzner is a close personal friend of mine, but I'm now 42 years old. I'm the age Leary was when he was fired from Harvard. If I were fired from Esalen, so to speak, my response would not to be a tour of the major campuses of America to set the troops marching and sending the checks home to mom and dad. I'm delighted that people 16 to 25 are interested in what I have to say, but I don't see myself as the Pope of the Children's Crusade. It's not like that at all. Uh, we need to reach creative people in all levels of society and in all positions of power. Creative people will respond to this. It is, after all, a personal thing. It's a personal thing. Uh, the revolution that wanted to give everybody LSD also wanted to uh, have sex in the streets. This was a banner. I've shouted it myself through the streets. But hey, 
Uh, is that going to do a lot for relationships to have an orgy at the corner of Bancroft and Telegraph? Will, will this make us all better able to relate to our significant other? Uh, I'm not sure. So I think a, a lighter touch. What was also absent in the 60s was any awareness of tradition. People thought that LSD came from God via Albert Hoffman. They didn't realize that shamanism was about this. They didn't realize that a whole, that there was a huge body of evidence that they could call on to support their position which was, this is what religion really has all, was about for the first million years, and this is what ecstasy was about before it became about, you know, silent prayer and abstention and rejection of the senses and all of this stuff. So it, that really, I think, was the revolution and contribution of the 70s, the anthropological angle. I mean, it's pretty startling to read 1970s or 1960s LSD literature that has not been edited or amended since. Uh, if you want to look at this, take a look at Stephen Gaskin's book, uh, Amazing Dope Tales. The book was published in 1969, so it's completely uncontaminated by the shifts in consciousness of the of the 70s and the 80s. Well, it's an astonishingly unspiritual book. What people seem to do on LSD back in the Haight-Ashbury, a lot of them was what was called power tripping and ego tripping. And people played games with other people who were on it. Uh, power games, sex games, control games. And there wasn't a sense of the sacred dimension. The white, all the metaphors are drawn from the transcendent realms of Mahayana Buddhism. Enlightenment, bardo, nirvana, white light, ego death, lot about ego death. You know, I barely ever hear that pass my lips. I mean, I talk about diminishing the ego, but I don't conceive it as a dissolving into whiteness. I conceive it as a coming to terms with the world that wants to be recognized all around us. So we have evolved the language. We have created dimensions for the experience that we didn't have before. And I think we still are. I mean, uh, LSD was a love drug, but it was a kind of collective. You loved your tribe. You loved your affinity group. Mushrooms brought in this connection to nature, and mushrooms were not available. Psilocybin was rare as hen's teeth until 1975. I mean, I know because I sought it, and my brother and I wrote the book that we did specifically so that people could have mushrooms. And I know who our competitors were and when those publication dates were. And it just did not exist unless you were very close to the, you know, inner high mucky mucks of psychedelica. I never, I only once took something which was said to be synthetic psilocybin because I didn't know anybody. I was a spear carrier back in the golden age. Uh, so, and what the mushrooms brought in was for a lot of people access to hallucinations. LSD is quite mental. You have to be of a certain inner constitution or you have to take a lot to have hallucinations. And then the hallucinations are of a certain character. Uh, psilocybin, by being visibly from the earth and by having this tremendous synergistic effect on the vision-producing part of the brain, empowered the extraterrestrial raft, the fairies, that was not seriously part of the, uh, of the LSD phenomenon, and so forth. So I think, you know, it evolves in time. We are filling in the pieces, and there are probably dimensions uh, 
yet to come that we all will be involved in. I mean, I assume many of you will end up psychotherapists, educators, writers, uh, people who will make an impact on society through ideas and through the, the teaching and the imposition of method. And so this, uh, this has to be part of the armamentarium because it is so salutary to all our, uh, our concerns. I don't know that they do. You might ask Angie Arian. She's the resident authority on the Bosques. I know they're into something called the light work, and I know they're um, herders from way back, shepherds, people who follow cattle, probably were into all of this stuff very early. You know, Maria Sabina, the great mushroom shamaness of Watla always claimed that she really had never been taught about the mushrooms, that she discovered as a girl hungry for food, she was left to tend the cattle, and she experimented with these things. It's certainly generally conceded that astrology, astronomy, observation of the stars was uh, something that shepherds were the first people to pay attention to because they stayed up all night and watched their flocks and observed uh, the horizon. This connection with domesticated animals, whether the Bosques today use psychedelic plants, uh, I couldn't say. Most Europeans don't, and the history of Europe is poor in instances of psychedelic use because the flora of Europe is poor. There are detours and there is henbane and monkshood and opium brought in and hashish, and, but it's not a psychedelic ecosystem at all. Well, it's, it clearly isn't the only path it may be the only path to a certain place, but if that's not the place you want to go, then you would follow a different path. They bring you to the discovery that everything you know is wrong, period. Uh, if you are not interested in having that experience, and many people aren't, I mean, many people when they get to the goal of drugs, say, okay, that's it. I'm finished with drugs. Now I know. I didn't need to know that, and I'm sorry I found out. Uh, you have to have a taste for the weird. The weird. The bizarre, the outre, the beyond. It's, a, it's an edge phenomenon. It's a twelfth house phenomenon. It's a scorpionic kind of thing. The, the other objection that you raise, the, the, that it's artificial, well, I agree to some, in some sense in that I don't like synthetic drugs, but uh, the banner under which the entire new paradigm is operating is that it is an illusion that there is an inside and an outside. It is an illusion that there is a self and world. So we cannot, we, if you believe that it's artificial, you already are deeply committed to a dualistic view of the place of the person in the world. It's the ordinary view that people are distinct from the world. There may be there may be philosophical churches here that can't be reconciled. I'm basically some kind of a phenomenologist. When you you begin to analyze perception, it can be analyzed different ways. My analysis leads me to think that the distinction between real and unreal is a misunderstanding 
and that in fact all these distinctions between self and world, between real and unreal, between inner and outer, these are in fact the very boundaries that it dissolves. So it would it will change you a lot then to dissolve those boundaries because they will then be seen by you as merely opinions rather than discoveries about how the world really is. Psychedelics don't say how the world really is. They say how the world really isn't. That's what they always do is they negate. They say, no, it isn't that and it isn't that, and it isn't even that. So they're not at offering a kind of replacement faith. It's really a religion of doubt. Th this is what drives people crazy. They say, well, you don't believe in anything. Damn right. It wasn't easy to get to this place <laughs> of not believing in anything. But it's not an existential abandonment. It's not like, I don't believe in anything. It's that in order to be free, I must not believe anything. Then all things can be freely commanded in the mind. Uh, and that's what psychedelics show. They say, everything you think is wrong, even what you think now is wrong. Therefore, even your most advanced thoughts are provisional. Therefore, if you like thinking, think, but don't think that thinking is somehow important. It really isn't. But it's hard to learn that. And the only way I've been able to learn it, I was, I am, you know, like a cured alcoholic, except I'm a cured materialist. You know, I thought that I could prove the correctness of materialism by taking drugs. And then I would see that all these people were wrong about the power of drugs. They were just soft heads. And I would survive the experience and keep my skepticism intact. But I, what did I know? You know, it was quicksand and now I'm what I am uh, because I got in over my head. Uh, your attitude is the correct attitude until reality makes it impossible to have that opinion any longer. And that's the reasonable, anybody should have that attitude until reality forces them to think something else. I mean, I would much rather have that attitude than the attitude that, you know, Babaji is God, or, you know, I'm, because I perform this particular ritual in this particular constellation, I don't have to be a decent human being. Uh, but experience, this is the appalling thing about these drugs. They are forms of experience, and that's all you can have. People who choose to go through life without the experience will form a set of impressions about reality based on the lack of that particular data. We can't all know everything about everything or all go everywhere. So the only reasonable position in a spiritual quest which revolves around experiences, is to be true to yourself. Be true to yourself. Try to think as clearly as possible. Try to transcend limitations. And then, uh, and then see where it gets you. And the other thing is, of course, you know, you spoke of drugs and I replied to your objection in terms of drugs, but there are all kinds of drugs that I wouldn't take on a bet. And there are all kinds of experiences that you can assure me will be good for me and I will still perversely avoid them because I don't want those experiences. I know already. 
Well, the drugs that I'm advocating, their greatest enthusiasts do them least often because it's so appalling. I mean, it is not recreation. I mean, you may call it recreation, but when you actually approach the big ones, your heart pounds, your palms sweat. You wish you'd chosen a, you know, back at the ashram or something. Uh, no, I don't advocate living in a haze of drug-induced uh, perception. I may, but I don't advocate it. Uh, <laughs> and, the big, and the big ones, it takes months to assimilate a large psychedelic trip. No, the purpose is to enrich the here and now. To, in, to, to enrich the down state, to bring, because this is where we live, after all. I mean, this is where we live. And also, you know, it might as well be said, people who take drugs all the time are getting the wrong effect. I mean, your system just adapts. Everything becomes like caffeine after a while. It either becomes like caffeine or it becomes like opium. It either puts you to sleep or it wires you up. So uh, it's about doing it with attention and in a ritual setting and, and, uh, and at high enough doses that you get somewhere. I mean, I think the worst thing you can do is diddle with low doses. The nibblers of this world are no friends of mine, you know. It should be... Uh, overwhelming and it should be an act of courage. What I've said in other situations like this is if you're not afraid, then you're not doing either the right drug or enough of the right drug. If in the privacy of your own mind you're not afraid, then you're just probably out for a good time. And I have nothing against having a good time. But I actually like having a good time without drugs because when I have a drug going, I feel an obligation to go to work, you know, think, look, understand. Well, this is why we might question the wisdom of uniting the idea of psychedelic exploration with late adolescence. Is that a good idea? to take people 16 to 25 who are trying to come to terms with being independent in the world, defining their sexuality, leaving their parents' home and getting a life for themselves. And then we add on, oh yes, and there's one more thing. You have to put up with this. I don't know. I think people pretty much have to self-select. Since we cannot legally organize, See, if we could legally organize, there would be a network of, of shamans and a sh who would be sitters, who when someone wanted to do a certain drug, they would say, well, who sits good? Who sits well for this? And then you would go, and that person would train you in whatever they had to teach, which would be diet, breath control, postures, mudras, dances, rituals, they would train you. And the last thing that they would bring onto the scene would be the hallucinogen. Our, pro our situation is different and a real problem. This is why we have to hold meetings like this. Uh, we're like somebody walking along a beach who comes upon a sailboat and decides they're going to learn to sail. Well, can they learn to sail before they sink the boat? That's the question. And it's going to depend on how smart they are to begin with, how the weather is that day, how the tides are that day. They may, they may not. We're trying to do the most difficult of all things, which is bootstrap ourselves, none of us knowing any more than any of the rest of us, bootstrap ourselves to a new level of talking about this. What we have to do, I think, in this situation is each of us tell our story. 
Somebody thought it was wonderful. Somebody thought it was terrible. Each tell our story and then try to create a set of techniques out of that that works. This is what I've been doing for 25 years. I mean, when we first got together, my peers at Cal, all we did, I mean, we took drugs a lot, but what we really did was we talked about it an awful lot. What is it? Trying to understand it, trying to compete with each other for the metaphors that would uh, encapsulate it. And out of this has come a, a very grassroots kind of consensus, I think, which unites ideas like shamanism, an invisible world, the importance of holding down ego, the importance of paying attention, uh, that nature is somehow a friend and an ally. We're putting it together ourselves. It isn't a science, it's an art. Shamanism is an art. And we take what we can get from all of these other traditions. Maybe we're doing better than we think, you know? I mean, I've had the experience in the Amazon of talking with a shaman and we're talking about something, how he uses a certain plant or something. And then I would say, well, you know, the, the uh, so-and-so tribe they know this plant and they use it in the following way. And then the guy would say, well, how do you know that? That's amazing. Well, I know it because I read Harvard Museum Botanical Leaflets, where this anthropological data is deployed. So while we don't have a grizzled old master shaman hung with bones and beads to guide us through, what we do have is a huge amount of ethnographic data and material collected in all parts of the world about how people on all kinds of levels of culture, but many of them preliterate, uh, handle these problems. So what we are, have is a kind of generic shamanism. And if we can infuse it with life, uh, it will probably work for us. I'm very happy to see that the uh, ayahuasca is coming up out of the Amazon and that people are trying to form circles. They're trying to do it right. One reason they're trying to do it right is because there is so little of this that you have to prove, you have to convince somebody that you're worthy before you even get invited. So it's not something that is just handed out to everyone. But if we could create a generic shamanism that we could infuse with life, I think we could probably create a series of interlocking institutions and rituals that would make this more accessible to other people. I have great admiration for the sitters, for the guides. I mean, I won't do that. I worry too much. I'm too susceptible to the transference. Uh, it really, I am so empathetic with people on high doses of these things that I can't stand to be around them. But it's a different calling. So I don't consider myself a shaman. I'm more like, you know, court jester and village bard. But the shaman is the person who will actually give you the techniques, whatever they may be, whether they're substances or rituals, give you the techniques to carry you into the place. It's difficult what we're trying to do because we were robbed a long time ago of this birthright. This is different than recreating a dance or a sweat lodge or uh, uh, something like that because this is all in the mind and in the heart. Yeah. Where does he go? You're right. We're hoist on our own petard. Well, nobody said that knowledge is, uh, that the pursuit of knowledge is not a dangerous path. I mean, I'm not sure that it can be entirely sanitized. 
And there's something else to be said about all this. I say we have to create these shamanic forms ourselves. We have to uh, bootstrap ourselves to a generic shamanism. But in fact, we have the most powerful ally which the traditional shamans had, and that is the plants. The plants teach fundamentally shamanism is a one-to-one -one relationship between a person and a plant. And if you know what I mean, you know what I mean. If you don't, it just sounds like somebody's advocating that you talk to lettuces. But uh, I didn't believe it myself until I got into the domain where it was happening. Nature wants to communicate. She wants us to pick up the telephone. She wants us to direct our attention toward the idea that nature can present itself as uh, real communication. If we could let down into that, then the crab that cleans our fingernails or the snake that sheds its skin above us in the tree, uh, these things then become the teacher. I mean, this is what the mushroom says. It says, you don't need the teacher. I am the teacher. And it is but for you to recognize and come to terms with that. It's not a tough road to hoe, and maybe it's not for everybody. And maybe we are misguided to seek to expand our circle larger. I mean, maybe what we should seek to do is to deepen the experience and connections within our circle. This is another way to do it, you know. Human beings don't believe in anything unless it's a mass movement. But when it's something from the heart, maybe the real authentication of it comes from a deeper personal commitment.